My name is Mick Napier and I'm speaking to you on behalf of Stop the GNF uh, UK and Stop the GNF International. And it's a fantastic pleasure. These are grim times, brutal times, hard times. Some people are suffering terribly. Uh, but within that, we want to bring some light into the situation. But four guests today, one is waiting in the wings to join us. Um, but the four guests today are, um, I don't know what you can see on your screen, but we've got Sue Goldstein from Canada. Uh, Khaluta Jarma, who is from a Jew village um, in Palestine, but speaking to us, I think, from the Netherlands. And uh, Heidi Grunebaum. Have I got your name right, Heidi Grunebaum? Yes, yeah? you do. Um, I'm not very good with Jewish names. I hope that doesn't make me anti Semitic. I'm terrible with Muslim names as well. Um, <laughs> And finally, joining us just on the cusp of the hour, we have Verena Rajab from joining us from Stuttgart BDS. It's Hello. a tale of four crime scenes, a tale of four parts, everyone involved in the GNF, and we want to bring out the commonalities of what the GNF does. It's bloody and cruel, or it has been bloody and is extremely cruel today. Um, so who's going to start? Who wants to go first? Uh, you mean in my name? Oh, come on, Khalid, you're the Palestinian here. You get a Palestinians don't get many benefits of being Palestinian, but you do today. Um, tell us, I just saw the very moving four minutes of um, of your grandmother. Um, we have fantastic films from South Africa, Canada. Uh, we got a really moving piece from from the from the German states forest victims, but we don't have a big film yet about the British part. But you've plugged the gap briefly, momentarily. It's very, very powerful what you've written. Tell us about your grandmother. It's a hell of a story. Uh, thank you, Mick. Thank you for having me. And it's uh, just give me so much energy to be with such a group of activists for Palestine. Um, I was born in either refugee camp, but my family, including my grandmother and my two parents, um, they to Ida camp from the village of Hajor. And my grandmother is around 100 years old. And my parents were children uh, in 1948. So they all witnessed the Nakba and they were all forced out of Hajor. But I don't think throughout my life there was a day that Hajor wasn't uh, a topic of conversation in our house in terms of what the life was, but also the loss and the difference between the life in a refugee camp and the life in a village uh, where people had their own land, they had their own agriculture. It, it is very different, just the comparison uh, between the life in a refugee camp and the life in the village. My grandmother herself has told us about the village and she always, uh, claims her right to return to the village and she says that if she doesn't get it in her lifetime she always tells us that we should as her grandchildren work day and night in order to return to Ajur and that is something she will she never learned about international law she never learned about the right of return or the UN resolution 194 but she always knew that that land was her land it was never sold, it was never given just like that. It was taken by force and it was always her dream to return to that land and she still does have that dream. And as her grandchild, well, one of the youngest of the grandchildren, uh, I also have that dream and I also want to work towards the right of return, not only for my family, but to all Palestinian refugees. And I think the people in the panel today are also working towards that. And one of the concepts of how to get the right of return back is to speak about what happened after the Nakba and how an institute like the JNF contributed to the ethnic cleansing of Palestine, which is a war crime. And I'll stop here and I'll, I'll let other people speak as well. Oh, you're, you're, def you're defying uh, Ben Gurion. I think it was Ben Gurion who said, the old will die and the young will forget. You're still quite young, but you seem to be proving him wrong. That's a Palestinian voice. Um, Heidi, you've made a film. It's just over an hour long. I watched it and I was... By the way, when I watched um, uh, 
When I watched Galud's four-minute film, I had a big bloody lump in my throat. I have to tell you, very emotional to watch it. And I also found your film amazing. Amazing, Heidi. Tell us why you made it. You started off from a Jewish background. You started off believing the Zionist myths about uh, greening a barren desert. What led you to make the film? Just a brief introduction, Heidi, please. That's right. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Mick. And um, hello to the other panelists across the four winds. It's a huge honor to be here today and to meet you all virtually. Um, so I consider myself Jewish. I don't say I'm of a Jewish background. Uh, it's a very important part of my identity. I live in South Africa in the uh, in the afterlife of the defeat of legal apartheid where structural apartheid lives, uh, is alive and kicking. Um, and I am also involved in uh, questions of, if not return, of uh, what it means to, to, for me to return to my grandmother's town in Germany um, uh, for, from where she she was a refugee. Um, my visit to Palestine in 2009, um, uh, uh, I was confronted by um, an activist who said, what are you South Africans doing about South African, South Africa forest? It's a huge forest planted on top of the ruins of Lubia, which was once uh, before 1948, one of the biggest villages in, uh, in the Galilee. And, um, I was with a group of South Africans and we decided to go to Lubia, at least to South Africa for us to look for the ruins of Lubia. And we did on our way um, over uh, to Jordan. And it, it was a, a very um, a soul shaking experience because um, one of the Lubians who is internally displaced, who lives inside of uh, 48, uh, happened to be visiting, and uh, this is a very powerful strategy that Palestinians use, is this kind of iterative return to a place of destruction to keep it alive in all kinds of ways. And he showed us, uh, he, he, he translated the, str the strewn stones and rocks for us. Um, and suddenly, alive in front of our eyes, we, 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 we realized that where we were standing, there'd once been a mosque, a school, a traveler's in cultural clubs, almost a thousand houses, almost 40 wells. Uh, it, it, the scale of its placeness was overwhelming. And to stand there under the pine trees um, was particularly overwhelming. There were South African victims of forced removals of the Group Areas Act uh, in our group. It, 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 it kind of pummeled us in, in all kinds of ways. And for me, I remembered visiting there in 1983 um, with a school tour called Tochnit I was at a, an Orthodox Jewish girls' day school in Johannesburg. And, um, and of course, at that point, I was returning to my land, right? Uh, so I didn't have to really deal with what apartheid in South Africa meant and settler colonialism and apartheid because I had an exit strategy, right? Um, and at least that's, that's how it appeared to me um, in the 1980s. And so in 2009, I mean, at that point, I was already involved in Palestine activism and solidarity work. But um, in 2009, standing kind of uh, amidst the rubble of Lubia and under the pine trees, uh, I remembered that I'd visited there on a picnic after uh, an excursion to an Israeli um, military oh. museum next to the ruins of Lubia village where um, a, a, a kind of memorial was made to the Haganah um, brigades that had conquered and depopulated and exploded the houses at Lubia. So um, it was very obvious that for me, this was a story that needed to be told and it needed to be told bringing the two places together, the forest, the JNF, it's um, the way it conscripts kind of Jewish consciousness into an ethnic nationalist project of ethnic cleansing, of politicide, of memoricide, and the story of Lubia from the perspective uh, that uh, could in some way do justice uh, as a, a story being told from the outside. Your, your film title, 
is a stroke of genius, uh, the village under the forest, because it makes me think, it makes all of us think about how many Palestinian villages are under forest parks and cycle tracks and beautiful places. Um, thank you. Thank, thanks very much for that introduction. So, most of the ethnic cleansing, the big wave was in 40 massacre, killing all sorts of uh, bloody crimes. Um, but Canada Park, the villages that are under Canada Park were ethnically cleansed in 67. The people there were driven out by uh, Yitzhak Rabin's troops. Do you want to tell us a bit about Canada Park and uh, what people know about that going forward, Sue? Sue Goldstein from Canada. Hi, I, I'm Sue Goldstein and I'm talking to you from the occupied lands of the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabek peoples and most recently the Mississauga of the Credit River. Um, it's important to point that out because we're talking about one occupation to another occupation. So if we're going to be against settler colonialism, we're going to be against all of it. Uh, Canada Park is actually also covers one village that was destroyed in 1948, Der Ayub. But in 1967, um, it, it's, they debated, but it seems like the uh, Israeli army had, uh, you know, had a bee in its bonnet about losing the Latrun villages in 1948 and being defeated there. So they wanted to take them back. So after the 67 war, um, on the orders of Yitzhak Rabin, the so-called peacemaker, the villages of Imwas, Yalu, and Beit Nuba after they asked the inhabitants to leave and inhabitants were scared, they thought they were going away for a little bit and would come at, back after you know, hostilities ended, but they were never allowed back. And Yitzhak Rabin gave the order to blow up the villages. So they completely razed the homes there. And over $15 million of Canadian funds were raised to create this park called Canada Park once referred to as a peace park. I don't know what kind of peace they were talking about. And so it was uh, opened in 1973. And there have been complaints from Canada, including from Dr. Ismail Zaid, who lives in Halifax and is from Beit Nuba. But there's also been efforts from people like uh, Dima Abu Ghosh, who is from Imwas and uh, based, I believe, in Ramallah, and they created a, a model of the village and where everyone's houses and where the trees were. And there's a, a, sh a short 30 minute film, I believe. I don't know if it's the trailers accessible online, but the full film, not yet. Um, and we've had like a tour with Haider Abu Ghosh through Canada to talk about Imwas. Uh, we put in a complaint most recently uh, in 2017 asking the Canadian government and the Canada Revenue Agency to look at the charitable status of the Jewish National Fund of Canada. So they raised the funds to, to put this park in. And if you go through the park, you can see the runes. There's like, the, you know, the signs will talk about Roman runes and a bathhouse and all in an old church and whatnot. But beyond that, you can see like these twisted girders and those girders are not from Roman era. And it's quite plain. And even some of the homes, you know, that they'll be like, you know, waist high for me, I'm short, but nevertheless, you can see the actual homes and the wrecks of the homes in a park. There was a short film that was made by Israel Social TV of a number of years back, and they were talking to Israelis who were in the park. Uh, they claim the park is open to Palestinians, but most areas that are deemed Israeli are not open to Palestinians. And the Israelis there had no idea that there were villages under this park. And as Mick mentioned, there are villages under all the JNF parks, at least 89 villages buried under Jewish National Fund parks. So this is a, 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 an ongoing crime. But with Canada Park, they still were raising funds. And I've been trying to look to see if they're continuing to raise funds for Canada Park. In 2014, we protested at a downtown bar here in Toronto because they were having a fundraiser to, be, to construct a wildflower trail in honor of Israeli soldiers held in captivity 
perhaps all two of them, I don't know. And so they've continued to raise funds over the years for Canada Park. I don't know if they're currently doing it because of the complaint we put in and they claim now in a story that was published by the CBC uh, a few years after our complaint that uh, they no longer contribute to projects that are uh, on Israeli occupation forces bases. Um, but this park is completely built in the West Bank. So it's occupied Palestine, even though many of us feel that all of Israel is occupied Palestine. But this goes against the Geneva Conventions, which say you cannot force people to leave and you cannot destroy their homes and they need to be allowed to come back. Obviously, Canada Park is a really egregious example of the Jewish National Fund's crimes. Um, and I'll leave it there. There's much to talk about. One last thing, though. One of the things that Canada Park and all these parks have in common with things going on here in Turtle Island or North America is that national parks have long been used here to take away the land from the indigenous peoples. And they, use, they get used as place markers, either for further development or as a way to bring in revenue through um, leisure and parks. So that's something to keep in mind about national parks in general. Thanks very much, Sue. Look, I've, got, I've got a question here, but we'll hold it back till later. Um, Jimmy, in the background, somebody's asking if we can go on speaker view whenever somebody's speaking rather than the other view that has us all like postage stamp size or thumbnails. Um, Great. I mean, I've been to Canada Park several times um, and the British Park, and it really is, it's heartbreaking. I don't go through the same tremendous pummeling that, that Heidi went through, having visited a park once, kind of blind, and then to go back later and see what's there under the soil and on the soil. Before I, before I ask Verena to come in, um, can I ask the people to put their questions on the Q&A and any comments you want in the, in the, in the chat show? <laughs> in that book, sorry. Um, Verena, where are you? I can't see you, um, but I know you're there. Verena is from Stuttgart BDS. They're working to establish links with uh, the victims of the of the German States Park. And I'm, I'm still shocked and stunned that that German States Park was set up to pay tribute to the German Social Democratic Party. Please, um, Verena, tell us a bit more about the German lender forest or the German states forest. Verena from Stuttgart. Uh, thank you and hello to everyone. I'm very grateful to the opportunity to share with you what we discovered about this JNF project supported by Germany. We feel that Germany is really an important uh, country for the JNF since many German politicians are keen to whitewash, or in this case, greenwash, the German past by unconditional support of Israel, uh, which, is of, which of course constitutes a very illegitimate claim that Israel represents uh, all Jews. Uh, the German forest is really a very ideological uh, project and a project which uh, is really situated in a in a in a situation of hot battle battle of Palestinians against eviction and uh, robbery. The JNF in Germany presents uh, the Wald der Deutschen Länder or the German the forest of German states as a symbol of friendship and understanding and as a green oasis near Besheva. It is situated within the Lahav forest. Perhaps, Ian, you can uh, yeah. show the map between Lahavim and the Kibbutz Lahav. And it is very close to Al Arakib. Uh, there are few few kilometers of distance. And Al Arakib has became famous uh, because of it, uh, of the stand of Palestinian inhabitants who defend their land ag and against the robbery and the destruction of their homes. 
Uh, indeed, many German politicians, above all social democrats like um, Rau or Eichel, became willing patrons of the uh, project, with, which was funded in 1991. And nearly nowadays, nearly every German state has a part named after it. Additionally, the Germany, German uh, Social Democratic Party has its own part and also some towns have their part. The GNF uh, claims that it is a green project, that the forest drives back the desert and brings fertile land, where before there were only sand, stones and thorny bushes. If we look, perhaps you can change the map, if you look at a map of the Beer Sava, Beersheba district from 1948, we see, quite, we see quite another situation. There's cultivated land, uh, uh, yes, and uh, exactly where the German forest now is, the Ein Kuchler Spring and as well uh, many villages around this land. In a YouTube film of uh, 2015, Dr. Abu Awad, Dr. Awad Abu Fred, he is also from Al Arakib, explains that exactly this land of the uh, where the German forest is now planted, belonged to his pa uh, parents and grandparents and other families. And he, of course, he stresses that they still insist on their right to this land. Um, if we look at documents provided by Salman Abusitis La uh, Palestine Land Society, we clearly see that the people who lived there before 1948, um, um, cultivated that that land. They grew it. Uh, they grew it for grew it f uh, above all wheat and barley, and also aerial photos taken uh, in 1945 by the British um, Royal Air Force show much cultivated land and contradict clearly the JNF's myth of a region where nomads grazed their animals in a desert. Walid Khalidi provides us with figure, figures from a Jewish ag agency of 1936. According to them, Palestinian farmed uh, two billions and nearly 200,000 dinams of land in the Naka by uh, uh, 1935, in this uh, time, uh, Jewish land ownership uh, were nearly not existent in these regions. It, wa it was the Palestinians who made the desert bloom and not the colonizers. The people who cultivated the land where the Waldeutsche Länder now stands are the Tayacha, they were Bedouins, but as all Bedouins in this region, they were at least half sedentary and had a clear system of individual land ownership. Everyone knows where the land of their family is. And yes, the Zionist militias expelled um, nearly 90% of the Palestinians from the Negev in autumn and winter 1948. The remaining Palestinians in the Nakab were forced to live in a certain certain part, part of the northern Nakab, the Siach enclosure in Arab language. During this time, until '66, uh, um, the uh, Israeli state um, made uh, several laws, for example, absentee property law, and so on. And those laws um, allowed the state to register the properties of these Palestinians as state land. In this period, the Palestinians had nearly no chance to stop this kind of land robbery. 
When the Palestinians later tried to go to court and get their land back, they generally failed against this um, Israeli uh, legal system of land ownership. A uh, famous example are uh, the people from Amal Huran or the people of, land, of Al Arakib. Uh, the Israeli state uh, tries to, get, to gather the Palestinians in the Nakab in townships like Rahat with very low social, socio-economic standards and high rates of unemployment. And many Palestinians went back to their original land to live in unrecognized villages which get no infrastructure from a state and do not appear on any state map as it is the case with Al-Arakib. In the Nakab, the state of Israel is fighting a fierce battle against the Palestinians who stand up for their rights. The forests of the Chain F are a tool of expulsion there, such as the ambassador forest on, on the land of Al-Arakib and in um, the Godwald, this is an, um, uh, a forest of supported by evangelical, evang, uh, Protestant evangelical groups, uh, also on Al Arakib land, and the Yatir forest in Atir near Al Umhal, Um Al Hiran. Um, with the civil resistance in the Nakab and all over the country, the Palestinians managed to compel the Israeli government to shelve the infamous Prava plan, according to which 10,000 of Palestinians would have been forced to leave their village and move to planned cities like Rahat. But the destruction of villages continues. Famous example is um Am El Haran. And another very famous example is um, Al Arakib, which was destroyed in last September, September 2020, for the 178th time. Um, of course, um, of course, we in Stuttgart try to support uh, the resistance of the Palestinians. And uh, we we target the JNF in Germany in several uh, events. Um, donors like social democrats and others um, silently cheesed mentioning their forests in the Nakab, but they did not withdraw their approval of using their names. Maybe our biggest success was a statement of the Robert Bosch Foundation that they will not cooperate with the JNF. Um, such cooperation was announced uh, before. Um, but still, we, we have a lot to do in, in Germany. And we constantly remind our friends from the left of the scandals which are um, happening in, in Palestine and happening in the Negev. In the place, can I ask you to bring your remarks to a close, Verena. We'll, we'll come back to you later if we can, mm -hmm. if we can, uh, if we can move so, in. So just, uh, I would only mention to mention our re relation to Nuri al -Akbi. We planted a tree in the place we uh, meet, the Clara Zetkin house. Uh, and you see here the photo, the ceremony. Thank you. Thank you very much, Verena. Uh, that's our fourth speaker. Um, to open it up again to whoever, who, whoever wants to come in, crime scenes, the, the crimes that are happening in front of us, we, we, you know, it's possible to find out without too much effort, but what can we do, right? Um, when, when, when I began campaigning on the issue of Palestine 20 years ago, people said, don't raise the right of return. It's too difficult. Let's just talk about the West Bank and Gaza. British government even thinks that, you know, what's going on there is, is terrible. But don't raise the right of return. Um, to say about that, and your grandmother might have something to say about that, would you like to come back in? The right of return and how we take on the JNF in our own, uh, in our own little area, our own parish. 
Thank you, Mick. Um, I think one issue that is important to mention here is how, how the, the narrative about the right of return that Israel tries to put forward is that it's impossible because there are people living in these places, these people, the Palestinians, to return to, which is obviously not true, not only because many of the villages are still available, still empty. And the, what we have heard today is examples of like how um, the, the Israeli state tried to greenwash these villages by planting foreign trees on top of the villages to hide the ruins. A few years ago, I was involved in it where we uh, took a group of children from Ida refugee camp to uh, 10 villages that their families come from originally, including Canada Park and the British Park. And out of the 10, eight of the villages were completely empty. So, and that can be said about around 80% of the villages that were ethnically cleansed in 1948. So the possibility of the right of return is possible. And the other issue is that um, the, the claim that the Palestinians cannot return to these these villages is therefore invalid, but also it is a right that is guaranteed by international law. So it is the right of the refugees and their descendants to return to these places. And I think the the only way for the Israeli state to um, to adhere to the call of the right of return is by putting pressure on the on the state and by uh, by showing the the crimes that Israel is committing, not only as as a state, but also within agencies like the JNF. So holding the JNF accountable is one way of um, of telling people what, what the JNF is, but also holding it at, accountable in the many countries that it claims to be a charity, and bringing it um, uh, and stopping it from collecting uh, all these amounts of money that go to either um, hiding ruins of villages in, in historic Palestine or to the Israeli army or the, the many forms of funding that go to Israel by the JNF. And as long as the JNF exists and that organizations exist, I think it is very difficult to, uh, to talk about the right of return or any right of Palestinians because such organizations are part of the colonization project. Thank you, um, The villages are by and large empty. Uh, for Israel is actually a world leader in absorbing incoming individuals. They have a ministry of absorption. Um, as long as you're not Palestinian, they actually can achieve miracles. The fact that they say they cannot absorb Palestinians is reducible purely to a racist a system of saying some people can come in and some people can't. Heidi, um, what have you guys been doing in South Africa? You've been doing some sterling work. I know the government's not as sympathetic as others might believe, but what did you do about apologies? That, that, that's interesting. Thanks, Mick. Um, so, I mean, I think that kind of um, the discussions in South Africa have been shaped profoundly by the sensitivity to ethnic cleansing and, uh, you know, in, in the mid between 1960s to the night to 1980s, uh, more than three and a half million South African black South Africans were uh, forcibly displaced through forced removals. Uh, it was the biggest um, uh, kind of crime of internal ethnic cleansing and displacement of uh, in in uh, in the 20th century, um, it, people kind of forget that, but there's a deep sensitivity to and uh, uh, and strong solidarity and sympathy with the, with the Palestinian cause. So we've tried, um, they, they're incredible activists in South Africa who've been really working tirelessly around this. And they took Mark Kaplan and my film and, um, have uh, uh, with ADRID, the Association for uh, Internally Displaced um, Refugees in, in uh, Palestinian Refugees in 48 and Zohrot hosted a fantastic ceremony at Lubia 
<clears throat> um, amidst the pine trees in 2015 on May Day. Um, and 12 of us visited, there were three, 400 Palestinians, including from the Palestinian diaspora from Libya who joined the ceremony. And there was um, a public apology, uh, acknowledgement of what our, uh, our trees, those who've um, directly and indirectly supported the JNF with the pennies in the blue box um, and uh, a commitment to joint struggle for restitution and return. Um, and we handed over 200 pledges uh, signed by Jewish South Africans to um, uh, at the public ceremony, uh, making this pledge. Um, in 2016, um, comrades from Adred, from Zohrot, uh, from Adala, uh, came to South Africa as part of a village under the forest um, initiative that my own comrades here organized. And I was very honored to be uh, play a small part in and, um, and hosted a series of public talks. Um, we also had the, the, the great fortune of being able um, for uh, our visitors to our guests to um, do a presentation on the JNF and on the uh, Nakba villages, the covered by the JNF, um, to a parliamentary, the Parliamentary Committee of International Relations. Um, subsequently, what, what we, we really kind of need to think more about is um, both the legal, the the kinds of tactics one might want to pursue um, through the very kind of complex legal hiding and dispersal of the actions of the JNF globally, but how it sits inside of the kind of Israeli land administration system, um, how it subcontracts out certain kinds of functions to Himanuta and other, um, other bodies, but also how, um, how lodged it's becoming in the um, hugely powerful and influential international Christian Zionist movement. And so in a sense, I think the, the cracks in the system that activists with various Stop the JNF and various Palestine Solidarity um, and, and, and BDS formations internationally have, um, have achieved um, the, the Kakal and the JNF, I think, is uh, you know, are turning elsewhere, and they're looking to the rise of the not only but particularly the white Christian right uh, um, in places like Euro America, and 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 gaining enormous influence and power through those. Uh, so we we shouldn't neglect the the rise of Christian Zionism through the kind of civilizational discourse of the Bannons and the Orbans and co. Um, in South Africa, we've tried to grapple with the issue of right of return, the, the, the kind of struggle to, to shift the narrative. It's such a deeply asymmetrical one. Um, it is immediately countered, you know, by all kinds of denials and rebuttals. Uh, when our film came out, uh, there was Im immediately a press release from the JNF in South Africa based, saying that Lobia was never populated, uh, all of its inhabitants fled way before the war. You know, the, but the, we, we might be frustrated and, um, and, and, and roll our eyes at these kinds of uh, unconscionable statements, but they, you know, the iterative nature keeps on reinforcing the dominant narrative of the regime. So, um, so here we've been trying to kind of work publicly, uh, less through government and more through kind of shifting public perception. And just the last point is to say is that um, comrades are with, in South African Palestine solidarity and South African Jews for Free Palestine um, managed to, um, to, to, to approach the constitutional court uh, in, in Johannesburg, which has a very beautiful and very moving uh, museum and art installation to plant, uh, it's, they're still saplings, but to plant something called the Nakba Forest. And the Nakba Forest for uh, visitors to the South African Constitutional Court uh, space um, is it an opportunity to expose both national, continental and international visitors to the, to the site to the, the story of the Nakba and of, 
uh, particularly South Africa forest and Lobia, so through Lobia to the Nakba and the Nakba villages. Thanks, Heidi. Before, before I bring in Sue and, and then Verena, uh, Kate Scott's asking about the film that Sue mentioned. It's uh, the, the URL's up on the chat box, films which we've mentioned. Um, Heidi, can we, um, can we share the, the, just the trailer or can we share the access to the full film that you've made? Uh, uh, Mick, Mark and I are very honoured to share the full film with anyone who wants to view it and to screen it. If it's not up there yet, it'll be up there in about five minutes. Um, so Canada came quite close, we see, to exerting pressure on, on the government or on state bodies. David Kattenberg draws attention to the, you know, the dug-in defences of state organisations. I mean, here in Britain, uh, the, the, the Charities Commission, the, a previous head parachuted in was uh, Shawcross, who was brought in from the extreme right wing organization. And from there, he repelled all attempts to, to, to bring the GNF to justice. But you guys got, you guys got some uh, uh, registered, some successes. Can you, can you share that with viewers and also what you think we should be doing going forward, Sue? Well, right now, we put in a complaint three years ago. And prior to that, one of the people who's done some research uh, also put in her own complaint, um, um, Megan McKenzie. And Ron Saba in Montreal had for years barraged the Canadian government, different ministers with look into Canada Park, look into the JNF, Canada's charitable status. And as it's mentioned, Dr. Ismail Zaid has been complaining and asking the Canadian government for answers. Um, we got, we had a petition that we put in and we had over 3,500 signatures and it was read into the uh, Canadian government and we got a non-answer saying, yes, we've received your complaint and we, we look into all these kinds of things and blah, blah, blah. It was a non-answer. And so we haven't really gotten an answer to the complaint and right now, there has been some contemplation about taking some legal action to force the minister in charge of the Canada Revenue Agency, the CRA, to give us an answer. But we're still looking into it because it involves money to pay for filing documents and all. And also, if we lose the case, it also costs a lot of money. So the fact that we're all together and talking about this more on an international stage and bringing more attention to the Jewish National Fund, to me seems like an important thing, like making those connections because the JNF works on an international level. They have charitable status all over the world. They have the support of governments, obviously. It was in Canada that uh, the first time at one of their Negev gal annual Negev galas in Toronto, they honored a sitting prime minister, Stephen Harper. So the JNF is very embedded in the histories of Canada. Um, so we're, we're just right now trying to think of, we've been focused on the legal aspect, but I'm thinking that we should go back to drawing attention to the JNF having charitable status and other charities losing their status because they give to funds in Gaza to help people. Um, but there have been some questions in the chat about how we function with the adoption of the International Holocaust Remembrance Association's definition of anti-Semitism, which as you all know, is an attempt to criminalize criticism of Israel and Zionist enterprises. I'm not sure how much of an effect mm. that's going to have on the JNF and uh, efforts to expose the JNF any more than on any other solidarity uh, projects with Palestine. Um, it's a battle we're currently fighting in Ontario and across Canada. And uh, I, I haven't seen, uh, there's no test case right now, but we're trying to see what's going to happen. The Ontario legislature has, with an order in council, adopted the IHRA definition. We're not sure if that includes the examples. Uh, seven of the 11 examples include criticism of Israel. So it's clearly not about anti-Semitism, it's about Israel. Um, 
I'll stop there. Thank Is there more, some yeah. more direct questions about that? I'm not sure if I answered. Well, it's, uh, it's, it's the elephant in the room, the IHRA. I don't want to go into that too much because there's been a massive discussion about it and there will continue to be so. And it's clearly an attempt to silence us, all of us. Um, but to, to bring it back to the GNF, if I may, I mean, if there's time at the end, we can return to the IHRA. Um, Marina, you're in Germany. The first um, time BDS Berlin came to my attention was a splendid protest they had against uh, the GNF um, some years ago. So you guys are struggling uphill. Uh, the pressure is much worse there than it is in, in the UK. Um, what do you think we should be doing going forward to build real relationships of solidarity from li uh, we live in us living in countries which are facilitating the crime and the Palestinians who are the victims of these crimes. Can we build real, real in the trenches together solidarity? Verena. Um, I think uh, above all the Palestinians really at the present day, the Palestinians in the Negev uh, need our solidarity also in nowadays also in Jerusalem, in uh, Silwan, uh, the Palestinians need our really present solidarity and within this struggle and um, in connection with them and with the struggle we also can clearly show uh, the role of the JNF in within uh, the the colon colonial structure of the the Israeli state um, the role they play for for land ownership in 48 and also in 67, the role they play for uh, the settlement movement now in Silwan. And I think we we should really try to get close contact to the to the Palestinian fighting all over the country. And I think this would help us also um, to to convince uh, to cons convince the uh, civil rights movements in our countries, also in in Germany, to be more courageous and to confront uh, the scandals which are produced uh, in in Israel Palestine. Thanks, Verena. Um, so I lived in Canada for a few years, almost enough. Well, I got to leave it. I was almost there for, for three years and I met Ismail Zayed in uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia. And he was, he told the story that um, he's a victim from Canada Park, from one of the villages, Emwas. And, uh, you know, that's difficult to put up with. But then he saw the perpetrators of the ethnic cleansing, the GNF, being given a medal by the governor. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, was a, a major event in forcing him, driving him, um, forcing him into a lifetime of opposition to the GNF. We need to tie up with that kind of energy. Um, friends, I'm going to ask each of the speakers um, to come in for a third round. Uh, refer to what the others have said. Give us your thoughts about how we can build. I mean, what's the starting point? Heidi, your film starts off very much from South Africa Park. But from there, you tell the story of the Nakba. You, 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 you branch out. To, I, I mean, I think that's a model. I think the naming of these parks, first of all, they're crime scenes, but the naming of them is an attempt to implicate all of us in these crimes. And I think that's where we need to begin. We can begin from there and then very quickly go to the Negev and other places. But in Britain, I think the British parks are an absolute provocation. Um, Heidi, final thoughts, but uh, take your time. Um, well, final thoughts are that we have to include the kind of um, empirical research that historians, social historians, archivists, um, uh, uh, ethnographers, at least sensitive ethnographers, critical, um, uh, archaeologists, I, I really think that in order to drive an international agenda, which can, I, I mean, the JNF is at the heart of the, the, the ethnic kind of nationalist enterprise of the regime, but also its settler colonial techniques, um, both from, from erasing, I mean, the maps, for example, 
that Israel produced after 48 show the Palestinian villages marked with the, the word Harus, destroyed. So the trace of destruction is still held in the maps. Later maps remove the uh, even the mark of destruction and the new names are kind of uh, the, the Judaized or say Hebra Hebraicized names of places, which is part of the, the kind of making of this ethnic national landscape um, is, is what remains. If we don't constantly kind of, uh, or if we don't build um, uh, an international and internationalist solidarity kind of uh, campaign based on our country names and implications in the parks on top of the villages. Um, but with that, um, really uh, r build, build our campaigns on the really important work that critical legal thinkers and um, and, and all kinds of scholars and intellectuals and writers and artists have been doing, um, I think it will uh, greatly embolden and strengthen a movement against the JNF. Uh, it, this, remember, this is an organization that has embedded itself in the kind of cultural consciousness of Jewish identity, both in Israel and non-Israeli Jewish identity. It, it's going to take enormous amount of work to undo that. Um, mm. And it needs to be, it needs to be a broad coalition with um, all the skills and uh, and abilities that we all bring to it. Um, and of course, the incredible energy of the kind of activists that are on the panel today, but also like yourselves, uh, our South African com comrades internationally. Uh, this is a, a, um, a very, uh, the JNF is, um, is, is a big creature and it's a complex creature and we have to, it's at the heart of the land regime of, of, uh, of the modern state of Israel. It's going to take uh, a big effort, a combined cooperative uh, joint effort. Uh, at which I, I think is possible, uh, it is possible, Mick. Um, I have, I, I think with, with, with a dozen people in South Africa, I think there's been huge strides made when, when I think if, if we were able to work with uh, people that you draw together here and all of our rhizomes and networks um, across the four winds, I, I think we would be able to make a dent in at least the, the narrative of the JNF. Thanks, Heidi. Working our way back, uh, who, who I'm going to leave the Palestinian till the end. Um, who wants to come in next, uh, Verena or Sue? Do you want to go, Verena? Or on, Sue. It's, um, on, Sue. Uh, anything you'd like to say to the viewers? Well, there's a, a question in, in the Q&A about uh, progress on looking into other charities that raise funds for the Israeli occupation forces. I know we've looked into other charities. There was a charity here in Canada, Beth Olaf, that lost its charitable status. And we were trying to see if we could, I think we started, but we haven't completed, trying to look into other organizations that raise funds to, to funnel into 48 and into 67. Um, that's kind of ongoing. But um, I think another way to build is the, the Jewish National Fund used to brag about being, you know, a colonial enterprise, you know, that, that back in the day, they were like, they were proud, they had those kind of muscular pioneer kind of posters. But now they're billing themselves as an environmental organization. And I remember from a recent meeting that uh, the COP26, the Conference of Parties, is, gonna, is set to meet in Glasgow in 2021. And we're waiting for them, Sue. We're waiting for them. Yeah, so the JNF sometimes shows up at these events. And I remember hearing the idea of trying to get environmental organizations to make them aware of what the Jewish National Fund is and to demand that they not be allowed to greenwash themselves at the Conference of Parties. And you see it everywhere. I mean, they're just trying to put themselves across as this environmental organization. 
a few years back, they, uh, they had a little event up north in Toronto at a synagogue. Uh, we we kind of did a little action there to interrupt and they had Shaul uh, Mufaz speaking about defense and Israel. So it was very blatant, the connections and some of the uh, film bits that they were showing inside the synagogue uh, made you feel that you were seeing a film by Lenny Riefenstahl. That's how weird it was. So if we could make connections, I know I've spoken briefly with someone about making connections with local environmental organizations here who are organizing in support of indigenous peoples who are struggling to keep their land. Um, I think it would be a powerful connection to make in North America, Turtle Island, that there are people of the land in Palestine fighting to keep their land fighting to take care of the land uh, against organizations such as the JNF. And if we can share, share strategies across the four winds, and I think that would be important. And also the film in South Africa and the apology was really powerful. We briefly talked in Canada about could we do that, but, we, um, but we'd have to do a lot of fundraising. like and uh, just even to get there. So, um, but I do think trying to focus on the environmental aspect and the greenwashing is a really important thing to focus on. And to, because we're in a moment where despite uh, the quarantine, which is related to environmental destruction and degradation of, of habitat, people are thinking a lot about climate change. And I think that's a really strong place to say the JNF is not inv an environmental organization. It is part of the destruction of habitat and of his people's history on the land. We have no choice but to take up that issue. As you say, COP26 is in Glasgow in November um, next year, if we will. Verena, um, anything to that? Um, I think um, Heidi and you mentioned two important points. We had made a very um, good experience with uh, international support when uh, we protested against the JNF. For it, it was very advantageous to uh, get many signatures from EGEN, from stop the JNF from Canada, from USA, from South Africa, and even from India. Uh, really, the people who were already sensitive of what the JNF has done, and this made, a, of course, a, great, a big impression on, uh, on, uh, on the donors we, uh, we addressed. And um, I think, um, it is. It would also be crucial to to take up a fight against uh, Christian Zionists, who are at the moment uh, probably the most active in supporting international the JNF, and there we can really show in which um, very far right uh, angle the JNF is really located since, of course, the Christian Zionists are the big supporters, for example, of the Alternative, far-right Alternative for Deutschland in Germany, the really brown organization. Um, and, of course, the, the, other, uh, the other movement to address really uh, is the en environmental groups. Um, I think uh, we shall we we think we shall start soon uh, to address the young people of um, Fridays for Future, which is, has become a, a very important movement in Germany, and um, uh, I think uh, it is important to discuss with them uh, which impact colonialism and wars have on, on the environment and to enlarge also their perspective of, of fight. And so we can Thanks, work together. Thank you very much. Sorry, Verena, um, I thought you finished. 
Hulu, do you get the last word? Well, apart from me, I'll come in afterwards with a few announcements. Um, but um, Hulu, uh, Netanyahu's drawing quite close to Mohammed uh, bin Salman or Mohammed Bonesaw oh. and, uh, and the other dictatorships in the Gulf. That's do true. we need to draw closer as Palestine solidarity activists to the victims of facilitated by our own governments? How can we work together? I mean, the BNC is fantastic. They issue great statements and analyses and they frame what we do. Um, but then we kind of get with it. You know, they don't try to, to, to control what we do in any way, of course, and that's a good thing. But how can we work more closely with Palestinian victims um, from refugee camps, victims of the British Park and so on, in real time to, to deliver a blow against the JNF? Your, your, your thoughts, Khalid? I think it's very important for us to organize ourselves in a way that brings together all the expertise that comrades who work for Palestine have. So we we are actually very strong. So there are academics who support Palestine, media people, uh, people who work uh, like historians, people who work in advocacy. And I think if we collaborate in a way that we bring together all these expertise to amplify the voices of Palestinians who are uh, affected by the JNF. That is very important. As was mentioned, research is very important, academic work on the role of JNF in ethnic cleansing, uh, environmental work on the role of JNF in greenwashing, the crimes over the villages. And I think it is very important also to, to document and keep the stories of the people who were ethnically cleansed in 1948 and 67 because these these people are like they, they uh, have the stories themselves and they experienced uh, what the what later the JNF did to their lands so it's very important to document these stories and to tell them to people all around the world and I think uh, if we can collaborate across continents as well and learn from each other's successes and failures. I think that also would bring us as a, as a community much stronger together. And I think the, in Palestine, people who lost their lands are still keeping the hope and they are working towards, and um, they want to return to their lands. And the show of solidarity is always important Today, I think more than ever, especially within the ongoing normalization of the occupation across many Arab states at the minute. So it's very important also to, to show solidarity to Palestinians and to continue to work. Uh, sometimes can be frustrating, given the, the fact that um, the state of Israel has a, much more money and much more uh, power. But I think we have justice on our side. So I hope that we can continue to work towards that as well. Um, Stop the GNF has brought you four speakers tonight. Tonight, sorry, Sue, this morning to you. Um, <laughs> from four continents, Sue from North America, Heidi from Africa, Verena from Europe, um, and Khalid, of course, from West Asia, from Palestine, although speaking to us from, from Netherlands. And it's a huge honor and a pleasure to have you guys here together. And I think I'm reminded of old trade union banners in Britain. They always say, educate, sorry, agitate, educate, and organize. We will cooperate to educate. Um, it's an education listening to you guys tonight. And we'll make sure that these stories that each of you is, is, uh, is dealing with is spread as widely as we possibly can. And then we have to agitate. We have to find out the JNF's weaknesses. We have to find the Achilles heel and we have to focus on that. I have to say up in Scotland where I'm speaking to you from, we've been concentrating on the JNF for 20 years. And um, they used to have big fundraisers at the Hilton with Bill Clinton and film stars, Hollywood uh, household names. That stopped. Uh, they were always met with huge protests, big, big protests. Um, at that Hilton every year, they, they had fundraisers at a golf club, a, Jew, a, a traditionally Jewish golf club in uh, Scotland. They kicked them out because of the protests that were there every single year. And, 
But uh, then they moved to a, a shooting gallery. They had no sense of uh, shame at doing that when Palestinians were being shot, you know, clay pigeon shooting. And we followed them there and they were driven out. Uh, the, 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 the venue in the wilderness of Ayrshire let them go because of the size of the protests. They don't organize openly in Scotland to do fundraisers. They report them afterwards without mentioning the venue. So it's a small satisfaction that when Palestinians can't move openly and freely and are corralled into horrible, horrible ghettos, we have got some sort of pressure on them. So we need to explore legal grounds, absolutely. Um, I think the example from France three years ago, the Pizarro painting, the, the, the decision of, a, of the Supreme Court in France, that however many times a stolen property is passed on to other people, it does not cease to be the property of the, the person and the family of the person from whom it was pillaged. And that applies um, every bit as much to the Palestinians. We have to make, we have to make that case legally and politically. Friends, um, what can I say? Uh, we have to take on the, the, the Christian Zionists, even though half of them are barking and, and immune to argument. Um, I'm very pleased that here in Scotland, the Church of Scotland passed a motion uh, damning Christian Zionism, saying that you can't use the Bible as a real estate deal to dispossess anybody. Um, the Zionists turned round on, <laughs> <there's> a, <laughs> so you need, you need, the Zionists turned round on the, in the Church of Scotland, who we kind of know are very attached to the Bible, um, and said, you know, you're using the Bible against us. Uh, you, sh you shouldn't be reading it in that way. Well, you know, they did and they, and they do. So the Christian Zionists need to be challenged by other Christians. The Palestinian Christians never cease to ask for support from their kindred around the world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when Christians go there and just ignore them and, and wait to, you know, beat a path to the Zionists to hasten Armageddon when Jews will have to convert or have their throats cut, I can't remember the exact um, uh, theology, then... This is this is terrible treatment of Palestinian Christians. Friends, um, we need your support. Stop the GNF has big plans. We will be we will be networking with these comrades going forward. But um, plant a tree is a is a is a serious uh, project that's already underway by several different groups. We would like to help Palestinians to resist by planting their trees. Um, so, you know, if you've got any spare change, send it to us. If you have you know, if you've got a lot, a lot of money, send us a fair bit of it. <laughs> Friends, I'm going to thank Sue from Toronto, Heidi from South Africa, Verena from Stuttgart, and of course, Khalud al a Palestinian hero, hero, heroine, um, a, a, an inspiration to all of us about how to fight back. And uh, Gurian was wrong. The old may die, uh, but the young do not forget. Friends, thanks again. A real pleasure. Yeah. Any questions, post them on the Stop the JNF Facebook page and, uh, and we'll badger these four wonderful speakers to try and give you answers going forward. Thanks very much, everybody. Take care. Bye.